Hello and welcome to this installment of Mantis Hacks. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at this giant 3D printed Lego bulldozer kit, which is the third in my giant Lego series. And this video is going to be covering the harder to make parts such as the tracks and the bucket pieces. And then I'm also going to be taking a look at how to make this kit radio controlled. Let's start by taking a look at the more complex parts to print. Okay, so I've already covered in previous videos, such as the giant Lego forklift, um, how to make these longer parts, uh, which are basically comprised of two printed parts, and then joined in the middle here with like a joiner plug and um, some glue, so super glue. So this is all printed in um, PLA. Um, so I'm not going to go into details of that, but if you do want to know how to make these, um, check out the uh, second part of the giant Lego uh, forklift kit, and you'll see how I did these longer parts. Um, so let's move on to the bucket. Just take this apart. That came apart easy. Um, the larger plates in all of this kit actually are just glued together and printed out of smaller plates um, because obviously there's only a certain size I can fit on the bed. And that's the same for the whole kit really. Anything that's bigger than a, than a six long plate would have been printed in two parts and glued together. This is one of the more complex pieces to make and is actually, it comprises of 14 individual parts. And that's just because I was trying to um, avoid using support material and keep the studs nice and round. So what I've done here is uh, imagine these four parts are missing. And this is actually the base that's printed on the bed like that. So it would be flat on the bed here. Uh, and it's printed without these external studs and the one in here, the inside de detail is printed. So you end up with that first piece and then you print all these extra parts separately um, and these parts were actually there was uh, some little peg holes on them and they would just fit in place so there's locator holes on the and the main part and they're just glued in uh, same with the bottom stud there and then these external studs again there was little locator holes and they were either uh, i think these were glued and screwed to start with and then i removed the screws once the glue had gone off and then backfilled the holes with my three doodler with some uh, PLA in it, which kind of worked, but to be honest, I probably should have just left the screws in because it's stronger. Uh, and then once they're in place, you don't see the screws anyway. Um, so yeah, so that was one of the more tricky parts to, to make up, um, but turned out really well. Next, let's take a look at these tracks. Um, I have covered these before in the previous video, but I'll just go into this again, in a little bit more detail. So these were printed on the bed flat down like this and there's a little bit of support material underneath this face here and I think possibly some under here if I remember now um, but the uh, the main thing it did take a quite a lot of fiddling around to get these the correct size um, but what I did do is rather than having plastic pips on the end here I uh, left a hole through the hole of that middle and I've inserted a um, 36 by 5 millimeter stainless steel dowel pin and that's really good for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it gives really good strength on that connection point, And also it lowers the friction between the two parts because um, plastic on plastic isn't really very good, uh, whereas steel on plastic works fairly well. Uh, and it's a very positive connection um, with low friction. So they work really nicely. Well, that covers just those trickier parts in this kit that I had problems with printing. Uh, if you are looking for more details on other parts like the axles and the knuckles or the cogs and pins, I have already covered these in my previous 3D giant 3D printed Lego kits uh, and I'll leave links in the description below. Uh, so you can see those in the giant Lego forklift and the giant Lego go-kart kits. Uh, so now let's move on to the radio control stuff. Oh my god, this is heavy. Oh. Why did I build it so big? Seriously, if you are considering building something like this and at this scale, uh, really give it some thought because um, this thing weighs 26 kilos. It's not easy to move around because it's kind of delicate. And also, I really don't know where to store them anymore. I'm running out of space. So uh, maybe go for one three times scale rather than five times scale. So here's the underbelly of the beast. Um, and so far, I've added uh, a couple of motors here and here, which are for the, to drive the tracks. Um, I've got a power distribution block here and a power lead coming in uh, and that's feeding uh, there's a motor amplifier dual amplifier here for the for the motors 
uh, and there's an Arduino down here and all of these parts have been built into Lego cubes so they can be moved around. Uh, there's a little receiver module for my transmitter. Um, uh, two channels are going into the motor driver at the moment and there's another channel going into the Arduino. And the Arduino is actually just uh, the sound generator at the moment and that's going up to these two speakers up here which are also in Lego cubes. And each of these speakers has a power amplifier inside of it. So I've just uh, plugged the battery in, so I've got power now to the Arduino and the amplifier. Uh, I've added the cogs on, so the uh, tracks are now engaged with the motors. And then when I turn the radio on, that basically uh, sends a signal to the Arduino, which fires up the sound and then I should be able to drive the tracks. So let's try it out. Okay, there we have it and the uh, throttle should drive the tracks and also increase the sound at the same time. Okay, so that was working pretty well, but um, one thing is the tracks were really fast. Uh, I used these motors just because I happened to have them and they only had like a 20 to 1 reduction on them. Um, when the, on top of that, there's a 5 to 1 reduction with the gearing from the Lego parts. But they really need reducing further because it's way too fast and not enough torque at the moment. Um, so I'm going to have a look at how I do that in a minute. Um, but first of all, let's take a look at this sound system, which uh, I found details of on, online and I've just modified it a bit for my purposes. Uh, but let's take a look at that first. So in this first little Lego cube here, I've got a, a Lemon RX receiver. The Arduino module is basically a, a Lego cube, a two by two uh, Lego cube. And um, there's enough space in there, I think, to stack like another couple of modules. So I could put some uh, different types of boards on top of that Arduino and stack them on top. Um, and then at the moment, there's obviously two pins being used to read um, my forwards, backwards, left and right from my transmitter. And I'm using one output pin here, which is the audio output. And this is one of the uh, analog right print pins. It's currently on pin three. Basically, when you throttle up, it not only increases the revs, it increases the volume. So it's like a load on the engine. Um, but it was using a SPI chip to change the volume on an external amplifier. And rather than do that, what I've done is I've got a fixed volume amplifier and I'm scaling the waveform data as, a, as I'm reading it. Right, let's take a quick look at this code. I've only made some very minor modifications. I'll put links in the description uh, to where I found the code in the first place. The original version, there was code that would deal with having an SBI input throttle, and I didn't really need that because I'm just using PWM. And also there was code to control an external SPI volume control. The most significant change that I made is um, controlling the volume uh, using software by scaling the data in real time. I mean, most of the code's the same. I've just stripped out the bits I don't need. And if I go down to the bottom to the ISR, here's the original code. And it was literally just reloading the um, output compare register uh, with the next byte available from the waveform. So the original version used CUR volume, current volume, as its variable to control the volume. And so what I've done here is I've multiplied the um, data retrieved from the current sample by the current volume, which can be up to 127, and then divided by 127. And uh, that works really quite nicely. I mean, the, the low end of the volumes do get a bit uh, noisy um, because we're only dealing with an 8-bit sample. Uh, but otherwise it works pretty well and it means it's uh, one less piece of hardware. Now the amplifier, like I said, is just a fixed volume amplifier and um, this one is from Adafruit. It's a 3.7 watt Class D amplifier. It's a stereo channel so I could run this uh, output from the Arduino into both input channels on the amplifier. It already has some uh, input capacitors on there so I don't need to put uh, a capacitor to get rid of the DC offset from the uh, analog output on the Arduino. Uh, if your amplifier doesn't have input capacitors, then you would need to put a like a 0.1 microfarad capacitor in line with this uh, pin, uh, and possibly a, like a resistor, like a 10k resistor or something. So if we look at this speaker over here, I've got this cube. Um, I'll show you how I built it first. So it's uh, printed this way up on the bed, and there's a hole there for a cable exit. And then I printed this separate little part here, which will get glued in, uh, and that would have been printed that way up on the bed. 
uh, and the reason for that is that I can push that in, glue it in place, and then I've got those four points there where I can uh, use self-tapping screws to screw the speaker into place. This is a Tectonic 8 ohm speaker classed at 12 watts nominal. So as I suggested, I need to uh, decrease the speed of these and increase the torque uh, because at the moment it won't actually turn on carpet uh, and it's way too fast. So uh, there's a couple of ideas to do that. Um, one is to replace this motor and gearbox, although this is quite nice because these have got these really long shafts and uh, they just happen to work quite well. Um, so I could reduce those. Um, so this is about a 20 to 1 gearbox and with a the, with the 5 to 1 reduction here that gives us a 100 to 1 reduction in total. Uh, the other method to do it would be to add some kind of gearing on the outside here. Um, so I could come through a through a 3 to 1 to a 5 to 1, so that gives us a 15 to 1 reduction in total. Uh, and then come back through the motor, but the problem with that is that this motor is not really designed to come through here. I could do a really long shaft on here I guess, but I just think it's all going to start to get a bit, I don't know, bendy and probably increase friction. So really, ideally, probably need to replace these motors, but I need to give this some thought and uh, come back to that at some point. Well, I was hoping to get the bucket under radio control as well as the tracks, but that's proven to be a much bigger problem. And that's partly due to the design of the vehicle and just down to how much friction there is in this giant version. So I did almost get a version of the, uh, the bucket tip working um, from this point here. However, I had to make modifications to the kit. So uh, this part here is usually uh, a bit longer. It's a, usually a six axle in here. This is a four at the moment. And it usually goes from here to here. Um, but when, this is, uh, when the bucket is down, this point here is nearly locked out. There's barely any leverage on this at all to get this part moving again. So what I did is I added another cube down the bottom here and uh, put a shorter lever length on this. And basically that just gives a lot more leverage to get the bucket moving. Now that did kind of work with this motor that I found. Um, I had this in amongst my kit. This is a much lower gearbox ratio on this one. I can't remember what the ratio is now, but it's a fairly slow output on this. All right, let's take a quick look at how this, um, the output of this uh, six millimeter flattened gearbox uh, from this planter gearbox here, the output shaft we attached to our Lego motor shaft. And the key to that is using one of these uh, Pololu 12 millimeter hex uh, wheel adapters. And these are made for RC cars, so you can adapt uh, 12 millimeter hexagon wheels to um, various motors. So what this does is it'll fit over the flat on the output of the motor, like so. And you can tighten up these grubs then through this uh, output shaft, uh, onto the output shaft, should I say. Like so. Now that's it's tightened up, that's got a really good uh, grip on the output shaft, but it's made a much bigger surface for us to um, adapt to our output, Lego output. And I've done the same thing in the end of my um, Lego uh, axle here. So it has the same size hexagon, which just slots on like so. And the other nice thing, it's got an M4 tapped hole in the end of this uh, out, uh, wheel adapter. So I can use a long M4 bolt to hold it all together. So I've got my Lego cube, which has the same size hole as the planetary gearbox. So we slide that into there. Then we line up the holes in the gearbox with the holes in the front of the cube. And we use a couple of small countersunk screws to hold it in place. Stop the uh, gearbox from spinning. Okay, so that's in place now. Now we just need to add our Lego axle. The M4 bolt down through the middle. And tighten that up. And there we have it. That's locked on really firm onto that output shaft and can transfer all that torque nicely. And then I've just added the bearing on there just as a final bounce and braces. And this would basically sit in the back of the cab here and locks into that cog there. Uh, now I can try and get that going on this battery, just fire it up, it's not very elegant, but uh, 
it should show us it moving um, but there's other issues with this as well but let's just see if we can get it working first okay there's one direction and back the other way okay so that works kind of nicely uh, the one issue is that when it gets back to its closed position I need to detect that either using a micro switch maybe on this position here uh, or maybe some kind of current monitoring to see when it peaks when it stalls out because if I just leave this to run it is literally going to shred these gears um, so that we need some extra uh, intelligence on that to know when it's hit its end stops rather than relying on me being able to stop the remote control in time so there is a possible solution for the bucket tip which just leaves the bucket lift um, which is that mechanism inside of here which is a rack and pinion mechanism um, and it's uh, it's really problematic <laughs> so there is just so much friction and weight in this bucket it pushes down hard on this rack and pinion which is sliding up and down these um, the smooth lego plates uh, now I did think about putting bearings and everything and um, you know I could grease all of these surfaces uh, I've, I've also greased a lot of these points through here just to get that bucket tip working um, but I really can't figure out yet how to do that and and make it work using the existing Lego kit the only way I can think to do it is do a pretty major modification and put some kind of a linear ram inside of here pushing this part forwards or lifting the bucket using the linear ram but then it's no longer going to look like the original Lego kit um, which would be a bit disappointing uh, so I'm really not sure what to do about that there's just too much friction through the whole gearbox that drives the bucket lift part it's really hard to do it even by hand on this particular kit so I might have to just leave it at the, just the tracks running um, which is kind of disappointing but um, you know that's good enough for now well I think that concludes this video um, I will try and address the torque issue with these tracks so I can get it to turn better um, on carpet I would like to go and try this on some uh, hard floor somewhere because I think it'll work quite well as it is uh, and I'll also take a look at the bucket mechanism and try and figure out a solution for that because I think it would be fun if it was radio controlled um, but I don't hold out much hope. Don't forget to check out the links to my other videos in the description below. Uh, you'll find the Giant Lego Go-Kart and the Giant Lego Forklift videos there. And uh, please subscribe if you like the videos. Check out my other projects on the YouTube channel and facebook.com forward slash Mantis Robot. You can also follow me on Twitter at Mantis Robot or Instagram. And don't forget to check the description section for further information on materials and printers that I use and also links to other videos.